Hello. In a previous video on mass incarceration, one of my main conclusions was that the United States is an outlier nation in its disproportionate incarceration of its population. And by comparison, other countries aren't using as forceful or as predatory or as active a criminal law enforcement and incarceration or corrections strategy as the United States. And one of the presuppositions in my mind in that video was that the United States is probably not simply more criminalized than other countries. That would run counterintuitive considering the relative wealth, uh, diversity, and popular American fanfare for freedoms uh, and lawful behavior. So, Again, the takeaway was that there was basically something wrong with the American uh, correction system, that it is overactive or predatory or somehow antiquated in that it's been successful in giving uh, roughly a quarter or some 20%, more than one out of five of its citizens a criminal record, and that worldwide, uh, there's no comparison. Crime worldwide, the word crime would be taken to mean something quite serious rather than uh, petty theft, rather than uh, some sort of argument, rather than a lot of the misdemeanors that American courts deal with. Crime worldwide would be considered something more like a felony. In fact, the word felony comes from French. It means crime. And the type of crime that goes on people's records worldwide is more of this violent crime, burglary, uh, grand larceny, auto theft, these types of higher value, higher impact crimes, rather than the minutia that American courts and police have become somewhat bogged down in, and therefore the, uh, the overpopulation of the prison system in the United States is an anomaly uh, in large part because uh, of this kind of heavy-handed strategy where small crimes are, are punished. There are very few private or informal resolutions of disputes uh, and the police once involved uh, just basically exercise little caution or control or little reason in their prosecution uh, and delivery of a person straight from the crime scene or from arrest through to uh, sentencing and the prison system. Uh, again, that is, that's in general. There are, of course, exceptions to a lot of these rules. So given that, uh, I am in favor personally of a reduction, a serious reduction in the number of prisoners in the United States and a redrafting of not only prison policy and criminal procedure, but also the uh, general strategy with which uh, Americans culturally and legally handle disputes. Uh, I also think it's important to recognize that there is one area of crime where Americans definitely stand out, and that's in the area of homicide, where compared to other countries of a similar population, of a similar wealth especially, the United States has simply more homicides has more in total and more by rate. And in this video, I want to look at rates and totals and uh, some demographic trends with regard to violent crime, in particular homicide, how those homicides are committed, and what makes the United States stand out. Uh, and then towards the end, look at some potential causes or at least contributory and conditional causes. Of course, I tend to believe in internal locus of control, that is to say, a person controls his or her own actions or behavior, uh, and that power center rests inside the individual mind. Uh, that said, I think it's absurd to suggest there are no external factors, uh, social factors, economic factors, cultural factors, which certainly influence and motivate crime, criminal behavior. And so just on the face of it, 
when we look at a map of the world, these color coding, this color coded system here for 2018 from the UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, shows that the US and Canada have in that same range of homicides. That's a rate per 100,000. Now the US has roughly 10 times the population as Canada. But you can see this rate goes from 3.08 to 8.21. And that's actually a pretty wide rate. We have very little data available for Africa. And you can see that a lot of these countries have that same color blue as the United States. Uh, and that's because of the wide range here. Those with the dark blue have an extraordinarily high murder rate. Uh, but looking at this simple one, two, three, four, five category color coding where this large portion of the countries don't provide any data, uh, doesn't really tell us a whole lot about the situation. Now, if we look at some of these other maps, like the world's most dangerous cities, again from the UNODC 2012, so it's not exactly the same today, uh, however, uh, a decade later, things have not changed quite a lot. And so we can, we can take these as our recent history, and they're also giving us some indication of how things still are today. Right? So you can see that most of those dangerous cities lie in the Central and South American region there. You've got some war zones through Central Africa, war zones through the Levant, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, conflict zone in, uh, again, South and Central America, full of conflict zones. Post-apartheid, a lot of racial strife in South Africa. Got conflict zones in Pakistan and Afghanistan, of course. And then a few cities dotted across the United States, Chicago, Detroit. Looks like probably, is that Dallas? Or Baton Rouge, maybe? and New York City. So a lot of this, of course, we can associate with the drug trade, drug trafficking, uh, as we all know from popular culture. Not just a myth that the international drug trafficking organizations uh, kill a lot of people, right? And they kill both people involved in the drug trade, uh, civilians and police, political officials, journalists, um, etc. So we can see that in the high amount, annual killings per 100,000 residents, 169, that's extremely high. But anything over 50, we can see, is very high. That's in 2012. You can see that countrywide, nationwide, over 30 is the top level here. And you've got Venezuela and Mexico. Is that Honduras? Okay. Uh, and then realistically, anything over three or four is really quite high. And the United States tends to be around the five range, five per 100,000. Now, who is committing these crimes? Well, men. Men are responsible for 90% of homicides. Women, only about 10% worldwide. Who are the victims? Well, by and large, men, right? Men far outnumber women. Uh, you can see homicide uh, victimization disproportionately affects men as incarceration disproportionately affected men in the previous video. We can see that American rates, the Americas, that's North, Central, and South. Uh, the farther North you go into Canada, the lesser problem it is. And in fact, that Central American region is, is really the hot spot, the hotbed for violence. Uh, but various cities across the United States also. That's the highest region for rate. Now totals, you can see in comparison, a much higher rate. You can see the difference in the size of these men here. The rate is even higher because the population of Africa in comparison to the Americas uh, is not quite as different as the rate. So we're seeing a higher rate per person. Uh, so more per capita, more murders per capita, more violent in general in the United States than Africa, than Asia, and then Europe and Oceania, nearly negligible rates. And you can see that Asia, 1.5, 3.1 for men, 4.3. This is the reasonable range between one and three, one and four, right? 
Same basic graphic up here, giving us homicide rate per 100,000 population. You can see men far outnumber the women. The perpetrators, who's committing these crimes? Well, some fiery rhetoric from uh, supposedly conservative politicians in recent years has suggested that in the United States, for example, well, it's the, the foreigners, you know, that they're entering the country illegally and they're, they're committing a lot of these crimes, and that's a serious problem in the country. And the reactionary or nationalist push worldwide in recent years has uh, mirrored such sentiment, but in fact, worldwide, domestic nationals, citizens are, are committing the crimes, right? And while six, six and eight percent, six percent of the total number of homicides is not negligible, uh, it's not the most important category to look at, and it's not uh, such a threat that it would warrant uh, some sort of serious response uh, as if it were a wave or, you know, that there were caravans of murderers crossing the border illegally with the specific intent of committing these wildly violent and uh, irrational crimes. That is just not uh, within the boundaries of reality. Looking at the world map again, we've got 2017 homicide rate. Now here you can see the color coding system goes from 1 to 10 and then the highest category is over 40, Venezuela, a little bit of Central America, and then between 20 and 40, that's really quite high, and that is quite a bit of a range. And again, we've got Canada and the United States lumped into the same color coding system, but that's between one and 10, so that's very safe to not so safe, right? And so this is not exactly accurate. So when we look at these, we need to think about the, the details, right? And this gives us just a rough view. Countries are, are large, vast, spreads of territory by themselves. And so individual cities or even districts within cities often have very different uh, crime rates and homicide rates. And then certainly neighboring countries have very different crime rates and different levels of safety. And that nuance or that specific detail is not really demonstrated in these types of maps. Now, how are people committing these crimes? Well, it's mostly guns and then some knives and some other mechanisms, be it poison or drugs or uh, fatal beatings. Comparing again, the different regions, Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, or the Americas, I suppose, are all together, which again is somewhat misleading. We, uh, generally, we would split up Central America, North America, and South America into different regions. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, we can say that the Americas, which as you can see is largely related to Central and South America, where cartel activity is high, uh, they have the, the highest homicide totals. Americas, then Africa, then Asia. Africa, very little data actually available, except for a couple countries. Asia and Europe, Europe reporting all of its countries. The EU is definitely involved in, in international reporting. So a lot of data is very robust out of the EU. So we can say that this is this high quality data. And you can see some countries less than one. That's, that's very safe, right? Uh, China, now some people are suspicious of the data that China releases. Uh, however, generally, I think we can infer that they are really quite safe as far as homicides are concerned. Uh, so somewhat negligible throughout a lot of Asia and certainly Europe and Oceania over here, negligible homicide rates. Now the homicide rate does not necessarily affect how safe people feel. So the OECD general average here you can see about 75%, 73% of the people feel safe and the US people feel slightly safer. So across the OECD, which includes a couple of South American countries, Mexico, the US, Canada, a bunch of European countries, the wealthier countries, OECD average, people feel slightly less safe than they do in the US, even though the homicide rate is lower than the US in places like Iceland, or sorry, it, it, goes, to, it goes to show that hom low homicide rates can in fact make people feel safer, but there are some countries like 
New Zealand have a much lower homicide rate than the United States where people don't feel quite as safe. And so there are other violent crimes to be concerned about. But let's focus again on homicide. Looking at victims and offenders by demographic group, 1980 to 2008. So this is a long number of years, a long string of years, nearly 30 years, nearly three decades of data in the United States. We can see that nearly all of the offenders and victims fall between the 18 and 50 age group with the highest number of both offenders and victims in that 18 to 24, 25 to 34. So 18 to 24, the highest number of offenders, 25 to 34, the highest number of victims. Uh, by rate and by total. Almost all of the victims and offenders are males. And again, that stands to reason that males would then be incarcerated at a much higher rate than females. And then I've highlighted this number because this white obviously includes Latino or Hispanic uh, as some Bureau of Justice Statistics NG, NJCRS and other census data and lump everybody together except for black, black, white, and other. That does not give us a very clear picture of racial demographics. Uh, we could split up races into at least five groups if we wanted to be very clear. Uh, however, it gives us some contrast between black and white or black and, and other, black and non-black. And we can see that uh, as a proportion of the offenders and victims, uh, just as was the case with incarceration rates, uh, black people, especially black men, as we'll see in a moment here, uh, are disproportionately involved in homicides, both as victims and offenders. And we can see a slightly higher proportion of black offenders compared to black victims. Homicide victims per 100,000. Remember back a couple slides ago, we saw very high rates across these South and Central American countries, mostly, and then Papua New Guinea over here. Very high rates were between 52 and 169, and we see roughly that same range uh, in that 18, that late teenage to late 20s age group for black males. So uh, it's a popularly known statistic that Homicide is the number one cause of death for black males, something like age 18 to 25. And so as young black men are just becoming adults, graduated from high school, no longer living under the parents' roofs, most often uh, out into the world, responsible for themselves, without job opportunities, uh, looking for a way to survive, they are uh, both susceptible to becoming victims of crime and also, we can see, uh, becoming offenders or perpetrators of crime. And I think we can infer that a lot of this is due to criminal activity with the intent of securing some sort of economic livelihood, which uh, we can say is the, the activity alone uh, aside from the violent crime, could be considered rational crime, like selling drugs econo in economic terms is considered a rational crime because people are weighing costs uh, against uh, risks. And in most cases, the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, of course, when violent crime is introduced into the equation, it's no longer rational crime. Uh, but these things are certainly associated that people who are generally in impoverished communities with uh, poor education systems and low job opportunities, uh, perhaps poor nutrition and what they're calling food deserts, with low access to transportation that would provide them access to jobs outside of their home districts, then they might be more likely to engage in criminal activity, again, with the intent of securing economic livelihood, uh, some sort of cash or comparable good to uh, secure their survival and that of perhaps young children they might have in that age group. So who are the victims and the offenders? Once again, murder victims of 14,000 in 2018. 14,000 is pretty much your standard number in the United States. The, the totals go up and down, but you can almost guarantee that there are 14,000, 15,000 homicides 
in the United States every year, which is really quite high, uh, both in terms of a rate and in terms of a total. And so sometimes statisticians and especially pol political scientists can sort of lie with statistics and they'll use a strategically placed rate to make it look like something is more or less of a problem. Uh, whereas uh, the, if you look at the total and the rate together, that gives a clearer picture. And that's what I'm doing in this video. So as a proportion of the total, uh, again, we can see that black people, black men especially, are disproportionately the victims of homicide in the United States. Uh, Latino or Hispanic, again, men, men seriously more commonly the victim compared to women, and especially uh, black men, and young black men, as we saw in the previous slides. So we've seen a lot in the news recently about mass shootings. Mass shootings are, of course, uh, one of those events where the, the public interest is peaked, and there's outrage, uh, and it's a what we call low probability or and high high response uh, event. Somewhat, something like a, a plane crash or a nuclear power incident, which are extremely rare, but in their event uh, provoke a strong public response. And so there's also a lot of fear associated with it because there's a larger loss of life. Uh, but the actual probability of such events occurring are quite low. And we can see that is modeled in the data here where we see single victim, sorry, multiple victims, multiple single or unknown offenders, uh, represent less than one in 10 of all homicides, or roughly one in 10 of all homicides. Multiple victims, single offenders. Now, of course, it, any, any homicide is tragic, and uh, it's definitely not something that we should overlook, but the majority, the big problem is just single victim, single offender, single victim, unknown number of offenders, uh, single victim, multiple offenders. So one or more people kill one person. Right? That is seven out of eight or more, seven or more out of eight cases. Uh, so if we want to substantially reduce the homicide problem in the United States, uh, then those are the types that we're looking at. Now we've also got justifiable homicides, which are included in these totals. You've got less than 1,000 total justifiable homicides, so you can discount this by a little less than 1,000. Among private citizens, this would be self-defense. Uh, private citizens, a few hundred each year, and then justifiable homicide would be the killing of a felon by law enforcement in the line of duty, roughly 400. And this should not include incidents like we've seen in the news where an unarmed person uh, generally a motorist or a pedestrian, generally a black male, is killed by a law enforcement officer where there is no apparent threat and so no commission of a felony. This data from the FBI says this is the killing of a felon and so this should not include the uh, few hundred or certainly a couple dozen cases that have been high profile in recent years. Uh, those are something else entirely. Who are the offenders? Once again, a little bit more expanded data set. So we've got a number of different age groups. We've got male and female, and then race or ethnicity. Some people will confuse or say that race and ethnicity are roughly the same, so we could con consider Hispanic or Latino a race, though in other statistics, Hispanics and Latino are lumped in with whites, and then there's a lot going on there. So let's look at, again, if we've got 16,000 total murders in 2018, which does not match this total, so we're adding a couple here for some reason. Uh, not all agencies provide ethnicity data. This includes other races. Anyway, so as I said, you can count on there being roughly 14,000, 15,000 murders per year. Uh, each agency reports to the state and to the FBI, and they use different categorizations, different classifications, different rules when reporting. And so we might find, as we see in this instance, a slightly different number. And this is significantly different. 
uh, on two FBI UCR uh, spreadsheets from the same year. So, but anyway, uh, looking past their methodological differences between the two slides here, 60, out of 16,000 murders, we got 10,000 male, 1,500 female, and 4,500 unknown. Uh, this is somewhat confusing, unknown. Uh, that means they didn't report, I suspect. So again, disproportionately affecting males. Uh, black African-American victims account for roughly 40%. That's disproportionate. Of course, whites outnumber blacks in the, in the larger community and larger population. And so black people suffer a higher victimization rate. And then unsurprisingly, you can see that the highest numbers of victims are in that late teens to 20s age group and even going up to uh, early 40s. I think we're seeing higher rates of victimization. Nothing much new there. So again, males outnumber females in terms of victims and offenders. Blacks, especially black males, outnumber other racial and ethnic categories in terms of victims and offenders. Uh, and that's where we're seeing some correlation between the criminal justice statistics and incarceration rates. Uh, though I did state uh, unequivocally that there seems to be something wrong with the uh, mass incarceration problem also. Here we've got sex, race, Hispanic origin, and rank orders. So this is the top 10 causes of death for all people. Homicide does not crack the top 10. Neither in 1980 nor in 2018, which is good. That suggests that homicide is not one of our big public health problems. But uh, if we look at four different groups, in fact, it does crack the top 10. So we see, once again, black or African-American, Hispanic or Latino, uh, males especially, face a disproportionate risk of falling victim to homicide to the extent that for black or African-American men and women together, uh, in 2018, it was the number eight cause of death, whereas in 1980, it was the number five cause of death. That's attributable to uh, black female homicides, black female victims of homicides decreasing between the two. In 1980, black female homicides were the number eight cause of death, and they were not in the top 10 for 2018. Whereas for black males, uh, number five in both 1980 and 2018, and also the numbers, 8,200, roughly 8,200. Numbers were not significantly different. And so there was little progress uh, with regards to homicides affecting young, especially black males, uh, roughly the same numbers between 1980 and 2018. And that is still the number five cause of death for all males. It is the highest in the younger age group. For Latino or Hispanic males, data was not available in 1980, but it was the number 10 cause of death in 2018. So we can see some trends going on here. And when trying to deduce what these trends mean, we want to be careful not to overgeneralize or to jump to conclusions or to use uh, emotional reasoning rather than our logical faculties. Uh, we want to be able to look at the data with somewhat of a detachment from a neutral perspective so as not to uh, conflate uh, variables or outcomes, uh, so as not to misrepresent what likely is happening, what's probably happening. Uh, and so what we can see from data, moving along, is that metro areas or urban areas are the, by, by far, the largest source of homicide uh, offenses. 90%, nine out of 10 homicides occur in urban areas. And it's no coincidence that urban has become a euphemism for black or brown, that when somebody says urban population, uh, just as if they said inner city population, we can infer uh, that refers to a neighborhood which is largely populated by black and brown people. And so we can see a, a correlation between urban residents and uh, both victimization and offense and homicides, whereas 
cities outside metro areas, maybe suburbs, and then rural areas, not nearly as effective. And the type of city is also important. So the homicide rate for cities of 250,000 or over is 10, which is high. And by comparison, that's twice the national rate. Uh, and we can see, looking back at some of these other cities, that puts us in this higher category, so it would put us in a different color, like Russia. Uh, doesn't quite compare to these most dangerous cities, but it's twice the national rate. And if we look at these other two categories of city, 500,000 to 999,000, that's like Detroit, 250,000 to 499,000, I believe that's more like Memphis. Cities which are in decline. Cities like Detroit, Baltimore, uh, Memphis, maybe Baton Rouge, which were at one point in the 20th century on the come up, and then there was capital flight, um, what people call white flight, in the 1960s and 70s with the Civil Rights Act and associated uh, protests and things. Uh, people with enough money to move to the suburbs did so. And the American car automotive industry uh, took opportunity to provide the luxury of being able to commute. And so American cities expanded outward, uh, whereas there was a time 50, 80 years ago when most of the population, uh, if they were working, most of the uh, people working in corporations and whatnot lived in the city where they, where they worked. Now people commute a lot. And uh, there are a lot of factors that, associate, that affected how that happened. Uh, certainly race and willful or voluntary segregation after the Civil Rights Act had something to do with that. Uh, Detroit is a perfect example here of a city of half a million to a million where the homicide rate is the highest in the country. Uh, and you can see that across all categories of violent crime, the rates are higher. Even though the numbers, not as high as those large cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, right? Those have the highest numbers, but they have a slightly lower rate than we see in these mid to, mid, mid to small mid-sized cities. Looking down into the suburbs, we've got a homicide rate of three, which is safe. That's widely considered safe. That's an average across Europe. That's on par with uh, most countries are of the same level of development as the United States. And so we can see that the cities are disproportionately affected, and thus their residents, which are by and large black and brown anymore, are disproportionately affected by violent crime and homicide in particular. And as I mentioned, Memphis, Tennessee, we've got St. Louis, Detroit, Baltimore, uh, these cities rank among the highest in violent crime. And you can see most violent crime per 10,000, is this correct, 10,000 or 100,000? Uh, this is to make the number look larger, what, per 100,000? That would be an average of 10 per 100,000, uh, which still doesn't compare to the, the level of danger people in, in that city in Honduras or people back in that, that first slide suffer, uh, but that's really quite high compared to the national average. And so cities, again, are disproportionately affected, and cities that are, I mean, Detroit is a perfect example. It's, it's um, let's just say it's not known for being a very racially diverse city anymore, uh, nor a very economically productive city anymore. It's known for being mostly run down. Uh, abandoned billion, buildings in Detroit total in the tens of thousands. Uh, entire city blocks have been leveled because the, the residential neighborhoods have just fallen into disrepair. It's a city that's famous for decline, a city that's emblematic of American infrastructure decline and, a, and the deteriorating uh, situation within what was once America's model city is a perfect example of what's going on with homicide and violent crime in the country. But we see that the most common region for violent crime is the South. And so that uh, is particularly evident in murder and non-negligent manslaughter. Uh, rape also, robbery, and aggravated assault. So across all violent crime categories, as well as property crime, the South is the uh, 
region responsible for the highest percent. Uh, and that stands to reason uh, if we're associating a number of different socioeconomic, cultural, and uh, educational, and other variables. Uh, the South is known for uh, disproportionate poverty among black and brown people. It's, it's known for being poor in general, poorer people with lower education, uh, with fewer job opportunities who are starved for nutrition, who are just basically struggling to survive, are more likely to commit crimes, uh, certainly violent crimes. People who have enough and have more than enough and have uh, bright futures and great economic outlooks and fancy houses and uh, people who don't struggle as much just don't have the same motivation to commit certainly violent crimes. Uh, that's not to say rich people don't commit violent crimes. It's not to say there aren't poor people who don't commit violent crimes. Uh, just as we can see across the income spectrum, there are people, individuals in each group who do or don't fit the general patterns. We can see that in, the, in all the other demographic categories as well. There are people with high educations who commit violent crimes and property crimes, even though they don't need to, we could argue. And there are people with lower education who don't or do commit violent crimes or property crimes. Uh, so we can't take a general trend and apply it to each individual, just as we shouldn't confuse the individual with the population. Uh, that's one of the fallacies in trying to interpret data. People often mistake what they can count and general, general trends uh, with uh, overarching rules. And so we shouldn't overgeneralize. Looking again at rural and urban populations, I believe this also includes suburban, right? Because we've got something over here from Pew, which kind of contradicts this USDA, US Census Service Census. Bureau uh, pie chart, where we say, Pew says, urban counties are no longer majority white. And so urban, we've got about 44% white. We've got about 30% of the people living in the urban, urban zones. This is what we might call the inner city. And we can, it's no surprise then that uh, they're not majority white. Suburban. It's no surprise that suburban is often a euphemism for white, uh, though it's not, of course, exclusively white. But it's majority white, non-Hispanic. Slightly less so than in the year 2000, in this 2012 to 2016 range. Uh, rural, uh, dominated by uh, white people. And I think if we, if we think of uh, somebody who lives out in the sticks or in the hills or on a farm, generally speaking in the United States, we don't think of uh, black and brown people, generally speaking, we would associate rural living with white people. And so then, again, since suburban is sort of a euphemism for white and urban is sort of a euphemism for black and brown, uh, then it shouldn't come as a surprise that if violent crime victimization disproportionately affects black and brown people, then it would be more prevalent in urban areas than in suburban and certainly rural areas. So we can see all of these different factors and variables are interconnected, interrelated. And it makes it very difficult to isolate one of them. That's another mistake people often make is they become fixated on one category, one variable, or just because one category is different from other categories, then they conflate uh, causation and correlation. When we can say that these two things are correlated, that uh, lower income and lower educational outcomes and uh, urban residents and certain racial demographics uh, are correlated with violent crime victimization and offense rates, uh, certainly none of those variables causes the specific outcomes. They are simply related. We, they're, they're all found together. Uh, the, there's no direction of causality there. Uh, though, again, it's very, very common to mistake these associations with actual causes, unfortunately. So once again, looking back at violent crime rates, number of homicide victims. So this is the total number 
and we can see it's gone up, 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 up through the 70s and 80s, 90s, and then down through the late 90s and 2000s. Same thing with the rates, which is good. We've seen an increasing population in the United States consistently over 20 years. Uh, and we've also seen declining rates in all crime categories. And so if we see an increasing uh, population and a decreasing rate, that means we actually have uh, decreasing totals too. So we've had declines in rates and declines in total volume of violent crime, which means that, again, back to the fiery rhetoric of recent years, the need for law and order uh, is actually less now, not more than it was before. And so while a lot of people think that violent crime is up and that perhaps illegal immigrants are uh, coming to commit acts of violence in your suburban neighborhood, uh, that seems to be a lot of hyperbole and fallacy and, and fixating on one specific case, confusing one with many or confusing many with one, which is a mistake. It's kind of like lazy, lazy science or lazy math. Uh, pardon that these two statistical bar, bar graphs here are the same. We can see that fewer than half of crimes in the U.S. are reported and fewer than half of crimes are solved. So, uh, even though crime rate and crime totals are down, even though we can infer the country is safer today than it was 20 years ago, we can also infer that uh, crime is more than what the official statistics say because uh, people aren't reporting everything. In fact, they report less than half. Violent victimizations and property victimizations. So there are many reasons why people wouldn't report a violent victimization. Uh, one, they don't trust that the criminal justice system is going to be able to discharge or solve the crime. Uh, perhaps there isn't enough legal proof. If, somebody, if you walk out into the street and somebody hits you in the face, well, that's a crime. But maybe there's no lasting injury. Uh, certainly every bar fight isn't reported to the police um, for a lot of reasons. Some people just don't care that much. They don't want to press charges. Uh, again, sometimes the police are reluctant to believe victims. And so people know that instinctually and they don't even report it. Uh, other times there's some sort of relationship between the victim and offender that the victim doesn't want to get the offender in trouble, uh, doesn't want to damage the relationship, and sometimes there are private or informal resolutions. So there are a lot of factors that relate or drive these rates of reporting. Uh, one of them, and this would relate to trust in the criminal justice system or trust in the police. Well, why report a crime if you don't think it'll be solved? If you know there's a good good chance it's not going to be solved. And let's, let's be honest, police work is quite difficult, especially when there are no witnesses or when people in the community are reluctant to talk to police. And in a lot of cases, there's, there are good reasons that people are reluctant to talk to the police since uh, police have demonstrated uh, capacity to uh, wrongfully charge people of crimes, uh, people who even, there are plenty of cases showing that people who are simply trying to help the police uh, are involved or are accused of crimes to which they have no relationship. And so people are reluctant to talk to the police at all because there is the threat that anything they say to the police, even though they are not uh, considered to be a suspect in a crime. Anything they say to the police could result in their becoming a suspect. So, uh, trust in the criminal justice system certainly influences how people report or don't report crimes. But also uh, elements of proof, evidence, uh, if the value of the property was great, certainly for a motor vehicle, things that are covered by insurance, people are going to report those at a higher rate because they need to file a police report and into, in order to file an insurance claim. Uh, but motor vehicle thefts are very infrequently solved. Whereas, of course, murders and non-negligent manslaughters are nearly always reported because there's a body. And we can't ignore the body. Somebody has to report the body. Uh, and there's going to be a record of the body. And so those being the most serious of crimes also, uh, 
they garnered the most police attention, the most public attention, and police uh, agencies provide more resources to those types of crimes. Uh, for certain types of aggravated assaults and rapes and robberies, I think we can assume that police budgets uh, are mostly directed towards those more serious crimes where there is a, a victim who is permanently scarred or uh, when the public trust, when the public is seriously affected in some way, when fear is induced in the, in the public due to a specific type of crime, or when the uh, property in question is of a, of a high value. So when looking at statistics, it's important to remember that not all of them are reported. But still, between 1995 and 2019, violent victimizations and property violations, property victimizations, were reported at roughly the same rate. So these decreases in violent crime and in property crime are not illusory. It's not because simply fewer people are reporting or people are reporting at a much lower rate. People are reporting at the same rate, but there are simply fewer crimes. In spite of that, perhaps due to exposure to news, especially national news, whereas 30, 40 years ago, people mostly got their news on the, the 7 and 11 o'clock nightly television news or on the news radio, which was local. They might have heard only about local crimes and only the serious crimes. Uh, compared to today, when we have access via cable news and uh, mobile devices of national news in particular, and in fact, very little local news compared to the abundance of national news, uh, people think that crime is up, but they think that crime is up even more nationally than it is in their area. And their area compared to nationally also makes sense because, as we saw in a previous slide, uh, in certain areas, the crime rate is simply much higher. So the average national rate of crime is actually higher than we see where most people live. Most people are living in the suburbs or uh, suburbs and rural areas together account for the majority of the population compared to urban areas, uh, whereas urban areas and urban centers are the highest uh, rates of victimization and offenses for these crimes. And so the national averages are skewed by those urban areas which have uh, nearly twice the rate of violent victimizations as the suburban and rural areas put together, or even more than twice the rate. So this difference is not so surprising. In fact, that's probably accurate. But the idea that the crime rate has risen is completely fabricated, completely illusory, and just a mistake. At, at, I don't want to say it's absolutely laziness, but it's probably a failure on the part of many people to seek news from many different sources and to seek out information in spite of the fact that that information might contradict their predetermined biases or their predetermined beliefs. So it might be confirmation bias. It might be the echo chamber environment of 24-hour news cycle. Uh, it might be a lot of things that have completely skewed people's perception about crime, which they think is increasing, but is actually seriously decreasing. So let's move on to how people are committing those homicides. As I said in uh, one of the earlier slides, most homicides worldwide are perpetrated by guns. And of course, in the United States, where people are famous for carrying firearms, this, there is no exception to that rule. 73% uh, of weapons, 73% of homicides in 2018 were committed by firearms and roughly two-thirds of those were committed by handguns. So looking at the total across 2014 to 2018, we can see that almost half of all murders are committed by handguns. And roughly three-quarters, two-thirds to three-quarters of all murders are considered, are committed by firearms. Handguns, then, are our number one problem far and away. Uh, yet, the Supreme Court has certainly settled the law on handgun ownership. The Second Amendment is certainly not going to be amended, despite popular 
political outrage that the one party in particular intends to repeal the Second Amendment, such a thing is simply not even possible. Uh, and not a desired outcome within that party, actually. Uh, and the Supreme Court has issued several different, or um, it's, it's issued several different opinions uh, supporting handgun ownership, uh, concealed carry ownership. And so that is settled law. But that is our number one problem. Whereas there has been a lot of attention to assault, ban assault weapons bans, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, mass shootings account for uh, a small portion of overall homicides. And so even if we got rid of all mass shootings, it would not significantly reduce homicides or it wouldn't reduce them to a level that's consistent with country, with other countries around the world that are of the income and development level of the United States. And it wouldn't likely make the country much safer uh, in general. And so, if you wanted to say that all mass shootings are committed by people who use assault weapons, which is not entirely true, uh, and we got rid of all assault weapons, uh, then we'd still be left with handguns, which might take a little bit longer uh, to fire as many rounds, but not, not so much that the same, the same end result couldn't be accomplished with that weapon. So, Looking at an international comparison, you can see the United States stands out both in uh, deaths by firearms and in firearm ownership, and we can see those are pretty much correlated. People are more likely to die by a firearm when firearms are accessible, of course. But not all countries are the same. Switzerland, for example, has a lot of guns, but they have lower than average deaths by firearms. So there are responsible gun owners and there are irresponsible gun owners. There are people who own guns for hunting uh, and there are people who own guns for, well, maybe they don't even know until they shoot somebody. Uh, there are people who buy guns with the specific intent of, of only using that gun uh, to kill another person. And so it depends what kind of guns they're owning and what the purpose is of owning those guns. But by comparison, we can see the United States stands out far and away the leader in gun-related killings as a percent of all homicides. Now, does that mean that all homicides in the United States are committed by firearms? No. Does that mean that no homicides in other countries are committed by firearms? No. So it just means that the United States stands out. Right. And it stands out both in rate and total. We can see the total second highest in the world for firearms deaths. This includes suicides and accidental deaths. Now, as we saw before, roughly 10,000 homicides by firearms each year. Uh, so a lot of suicides. But deaths, we can see the death rate far exceeds India. India has a population three times the size of the United States, has fewer total deaths and fewer, far fewer deaths uh, by rate. And we can then infer that firearms are not nearly as accessible in India. Perhaps there are different laws. In places like Australia, after uh, Australia and Scotland, after a couple mass shootings, uh, the parliaments outlawed personal ownership of guns and people more or less complied. That's of course not an option in the United States. Uh, and again, that is settled law, that's constitutional, that's not going to change. And so then how to correct this imbalance becomes problematic because it involves not only crafting policy, because murder has been illegal since the beginning of time, basically. Uh, people know that murder is illegal. And people know that if they commit murder, then they're going to at least go to jail for a very long time. So providing punishments and penalties, including the death penalty, aren't necessarily deterrent, deterrents for murder because that's not a rational crime. People don't commit murder because uh, they're thinking clearly. People commit murder out of, out of rage, out of emotional states that are not logical, they're not rational, and they're not thinking about the consequences. They're thinking about uh, a short-term solution to a long-term problem, maybe. But making guns illegal won't necessarily wouldn't necessarily 
solve the problem either because people can use other implements, other mechanisms to commit homicides. And so to remove that intent to uh, kill from people across a culture it involves a lot of complicated processes that extend far beyond uh, the parliament or the Congress, right? We can't legislate that people would act in a moral capacity, right? Uh, in, in fact, they've tried, you know, this, uh, this has been an argument for many, many years. And we've seen some violent crime, crime reductions, but studies have suggested that uh, punishment or capital punishment especially is not a deterrent for uh, homicide, right? So we can see the same sort of trend when we look at a lot of people say, well, if we just banned assault weapons, then we would see a significant reduction in violent crime because during the Brady Bill assault weapons ban, we saw a reduction in violent crime. And that's true, but there were also other coinciding factors like the three strikes law uh, that put more people in prison for life for many different offenses, including stealing $100 worth of videos a few times from a local Walmart or something, one case in California. Uh, people went to, life, went to prison for life for absurd reasons, not just for very good reasons, but they had three felonies. Uh, what's a felony in each state? What constitutes a felony uh, depends on that state, and how courts pursue those felony convictions depends from district to district. So people not only went to prison for being uh, dangerous elements in society, but they also went to prison for technicalities. And that costs, there's a, there's a human cost, there's a capital cost in housing those prisoners, there's a social cost in uh, again, creating more and more criminal records for a society where roughly more than one in five Americans have a criminal record. So that increases uh, transgenerational poverty. It, increases, it decreases work opportunities. There are all sorts of different cultural, social costs to imprisonment. Uh, we see that crime went down as prison went up. So again, in the previous video, I mentioned that uh, this could be seen as a success, that, well, we put more people in prison and then crime went down. So we kept the, cr prison, we kept the criminals off the street, and so that was a good strategy. Well, yes and no, because there were other interfering variables. We can't isolate, just like we can't isolate race or income or education level or age, because there are all of these other variables, uh, influencing criminal activity. We can't isolate a specific policy or an imprisonment strategy and say that is the ultimate cause for the reduction in violent crime because there are, there are other interfering variables. Right? It's a mistake to uh, infer causation from correlation. Right? There was also a lot of economic growth in this period. There were social and cultural changes many different things happening at the same time. So coming to a close, looking at a solution for this problem of homicide, uh, violent crime, but in particular homicide, and especially gun-related homicide, uh, I always come back to cultural change and cultural paradigm shift, where people need to independently and individually, going back to that internal locus of control as compared to the external locus of control, people need to uh, empower themselves and others to think more rationally, to think clearly, and to not make those mistakes that would cost them their life, cost others their lives, right? And in order to do that, uh, certainly education helps and income opportunities, or economic, economic or work opportunities help uh, staying away from drugs and alcohol. Alcohol especially uh, is associated with nearly uh, two out of five violent criminal incidents. Certainly in the nighttime economy, alcohol is associated with most violent crime, uh, but not all. So again, it's a mistake to think that just because somebody lives in an urban area that they're black or brown, that's not always true. It's a mistake that, to think that just because somebody's been convicted of a homicide that they did it, that's not always true. I didn't talk about wrongful convictions in this video, but 
uh, there are outliers and exceptions to these rules or these general trends. It's a mistake to think that just because somebody's poor that they are automatically more likely to have committed a crime than somebody in another income category. It's a mistake to think that if we line up six people at random, say one of them committed a crime, and one of them is black, one of them is Latino, two of them are men, four of them are women, you know, et cetera, a number of different combinations of these racial, economic, income categories that we can pick which one did it just based on those categories. That, that's a mistake. There are rich white people that kill people. There are poor black people that don't kill people. There are uh, very smart, educated people that commit violent crimes. There are lesser educated uh, people from low-income districts who live morally upstanding lives. So there are maybe general trends or averages, but we don't want to have such a simple rubric. We don't want to oversimplify as oversimplify or overgeneralize uh, how we look at the picture, how we look at the entire situation. All right, so into the future, it's important that we try to increase education. And by one thing that, ha that has shown success in improving quality of life, people's psychological well-being, people's social well-being, is improving their education, providing them with more opportunities to uh, develop themselves, to uh, have a, a higher sense of purpose through work, uh, to develop confidence and verbal and uh, logical faculties, critical thinking. And that happens through education. It doesn't necessarily have to, have to happen through education, but education is a standard and proven pathway to improve quality of life and even lawful behavior. Among, among a specific group of people, among all people in the population as well. So if people have poor education, like they might in those poor, rur, rur, or poor urban and rural neighborhoods, then uh, it's gonna reduce their resilience to crime victimization. So they're gonna be more susceptible to crime. They're not gonna be, be able to bounce back from that crime as much. They might become trapped in a cycle of poverty and crime and transgenerational abuse, victimization, offending, substance abuse, uh, and the interpersonal relationships might not have as much value such that they wouldn't think as clearly and step back and assess the situation. They might make more irrational decisions and more mistakes in their life. Uh, people whose parents are in jail are more likely to go to jail, and they're more likely to be poor. So it's no coincidence that all of these factors are related poverty, low education, uh, certain racial categories, which are, again, a direct result of historical inequality and racism, of course. Uh, but moving forward, we can't make the mistake of assuming that these are limiting factors, that, well, you know, these people in this neighborhood, in this demographic category uh, have developed a pattern where they are moving up, there's upward mobility, they're going to better schools, and that there's this uh, sort of flywheel, springboard flywheel situation where their being born into a certain category increases their likelihood of success, whereas compared to another group, they're being born into a comparatively worse situation decreases their likelihood of success. We shouldn't resort to a sort of fatalism where we think that that's their lot in life, and if they don't rise out of that independently, then you know, that's, that's their choice, and that there's only that internal locus of control. And whatever happens to them is of their own doing. Uh, that's, that's not really a functional society, and I think that's how we've come in the United States to have such a high murder rate, which does imply a lower valuation of human life than we see in other countries. And so in order to start from where we are now and get to a much, much different homicide rate, homicide total, we've got to learn to understand each other 
and develop that core sense of value for others, that sympathy, that empathy. And that might begin with understanding that somebody's starting point doesn't have to be their ending point, but their uh, movement from start to end or up or down through the income or education scale is not only of their own doing, but rather it, it does require uh, some support in a community of, of people uh, who are making that possible. And so that includes public policy, it includes charitable private contributions, it includes education, it includes job training, it includes uh, infrastructure, it, in it includes a number of different elements to come up with this solution. And those, those different uh, strategies don't have to be targeted at specific groups in isolation because these in the United States people are mixed we we don't just live in isolation and there aren't firm boundaries around our different demographic demographic populations there's there's mix and there's flow and there's movement and so we can have projects and public funding and private funding and people working toward uh, improving these situations without, uh, without leaving people outside of that mix, right? We can include the entire population. Uh, I mean, it, I think it's, it's sort of a given that people in high-income neighborhoods don't really need a lot of assistance. They seem to be doing well. So when I say we can include everybody, I mean, I mean we can include all these poor and lower and middle income districts and families and populations, uh, regardless of demographic or uh, racial or income uh, distributions within those larger segments, we can include all of these different types of people, men, women, black, white, brown, Latino, etc., into the solution mix uh, but that starts with education, it starts with public funding. And I think that's the, the number one hurdle right there, to get public funding at a, a local, state, and federal level into communities where it's needed, and then to get that public funding to produce results. Uh, to me, education and job training are the, the number one and two priorities. But it also includes infrastructure, and it includes a change of public policy where we kind of, again, uh, nutrition, going back to food deserts, uh, these are all related in how people think and how they behave and their capacity to reason. You know, it's, it's, it's all related to uh, nutrition also. So there's a larger, in, in closing, there's a larger argument and a larger case to be made for massive changes uh, that might seem somewhat unrelated to the homicide or violent victimization problem. Uh, however, I think for a, such a large and odd problem like we have with homicide in the United States, it's going to require a, a serious and comprehensive solution. Okay, so uh, talk amongst yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>